Uh, well, thanks for showing up for the um, for a talk for which the the title was originally a joke. Uh, but uh, that's kind of actually what I actually wanted to talk about because one of the, the you know people ask me at parties, you know, what do you do? And I say, well, I'm I do computer science and journalism. And the, normally the answer I get is something like, uh, aren't they the opposite of each other? <laughs> and so this is this is really what I want to talk about uh, is is bridging these cultures and these, these techniques and these, these practices and ideas from both of them. And that one, uh, there's a big computer-assisted reporting conference every year. And uh, one of them, somebody called it words versus nerds. <laughs> and so this is really the problem, right? There's these different traditions. You have the, uh, the idea of you know, the, the journalist as a, as a literary figure or someone who comes from uh, a writerly background and uh, wants to provide sort of, uh, is a storyteller or wants to provide rich descriptions of, of uh, things in, in public life. Um, and then you have this idea of the, the, the nerds, right? The people with the quantitative background. So engineers, uh, statistics, computer science. Um, I think maybe that guy's an accountant, I don't know. Uh, and there's the idea that this is a different, a different type of description or, or something different drives them. Uh, and my experience is that actually there's, there's a lot of common ground here. Um, first of all, the stereotypes are wrong. I don't think actually wanting to be a good writer is a good reason to get into journalism. I think if you want to write, you should probably just write. There's, there's, there's something else at the core of journalism, something about representing ideas to the public or maybe ideas around accountability. But uh, engineers and computer scientists and statisticians want to do this too sometimes. So there's really, there's really only one, there's only one academic paper certainly with computational journalism in the title, uh, which is this, which was written by um, Sarah Cohen, who is a, a former investigator, investigative reporter for the Washington Post, now with the New York Times. Uh, and then two other computer scientists. And they're sort of getting at this idea that um, computer science is involved in different aspects of the journalism process. Right? So they're saying discovered, presented, aggregated, monetized, and archives. And they also list a bunch of technologies. Topic detection, video analysis, personalization, aggregation, visualization, and sense making. Uh, and I, this is what I want to do today, is sort of explore all of the areas in journalism where uh, computer science techniques are interesting and useful as a, as, a try to, as a way to try to organize this. I'm going to do this by talking about a story. This is a, a, story, a story in the broad sense. It's, a, it's an issue of public concern. Um, how many of you remember this, this incident? This was 2007. It made international headlines at the time. Right, so these are, uh, is a, there was a company called Blackwater involved, right? Does that, that ring a bell for some of you? Right, so the, these are um, private uh, armed security contractors uh, working in Iraq during the Iraq war. And uh, these, there are many of them. These particular ones were hired by the US Department of State to protect diplomats. And one of the issues with this was that they're not military, so they're not covered by various uh, uh, agreements between, or, or various pieces of military law. So if a, if a soldier shoots a civilian uh, unjustly, they can be court-martialed. They can be tried in the military justice system. But uh, because they weren't working for the Department of Defense, but the State Department, there was actually, it wasn't clear if they could be prosecuted at all for this sort of thing, if in fact it was uh, an illegal act, which, you know, if they shoot 14 people in a public square, it raises questions. So this went on, um, there were, there was various pieces of reporting on this. Um, there were a few other incidents where uh, uh, contractors shot civilians. I wanted to try to take a little bit of a different approach uh, because what happened is we got 5,000 pages of this. 
uh, a reporter named John Cook, John Cook, who worked at that time for a magazine called Reason, now works for Gawker, uh, filed a Freedom of Information request in early 2008 and said, give me all your reports on every time one of these contractors drew a weapon or fired a weapon. And this is called an escalation of force report. And uh, I want to show you what the raw material of this looks like. Hang on. Here you go. So here's, um, here's some of it. There's sort of these re the report cover pages that look like this. And then there'll be some reports and some photocopies of forms. And it just sort of goes on for a while. And a little bit more, and some more of it, 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 and some more of it. Um, it's this high when you print it out. It's 4,500 pages covering three years. Uh, I didn't want to read it. Nobody wants to read that much material. And in fact, as recent history has shown, this is actually not, first of all, this is a common amount of material. Um, you know, uh, f getting 5,000 pages from a Freedom of Information request is actually quite common at this point. It, it, at the Associated Press, it happens about every other week. Uh, also, this is not even particularly large by modern standards. You're, of course, familiar with the WikiLeaks material. That was 390,000 reports. Or the diplomatic cables, which there's about a quarter of a million of those. So this isn't even large by modern standards but still too big to read on a deadline. But the promise of this material is that you'll be able to draw a bigger picture, uh, draw some larger conclusions about what was going on with these uh, contractors, as opposed to just the most uh, egregious incidents to try to get an idea of the, what, what did they do on a day-to-day -day basis? Was this normal? Was this strange? So around this time, I was working on a tool which uh, came to be called Overview. Uh, this is, uh, a, I'm showing you a prototype. There's now a, um, a web-based version that's a lot easier to use, but I'm gonna show you this one because it, it uh, illustrates some of the principles that I wanna talk about. Uh, and the idea is that um, there's about 660 individual reports, and each of these dots is one of these reports. So if I click on a dot, oh, sorry, I need to turn on my, my internet here, or this won't work. If I click on a dot, what it's showing me here is a list of keywords, black sedan, rear observer, and then Apple will advertise at me, wastewater, unclassified, and then I can select that individual document, and if the internet gods are with us, it will actually load up in that window in a moment. Oh, it's downloading something. We'll just assume that's, that's going to work in a moment. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to get the computer to organize them for me. So there's this button called cluster. And when I press that button, what happens is the computer tries to pull documents that are similar, have similar sets of key words in them, and bring them closer together. So, for example, these ones over here, hmm, this is really a bummer that normally in here it would be loading up the original document. You know, one of, one of these things would be in there. Anyway, it's, it's, going, it's going to show me that if I select all of them, they all have this status closed is the, is the first uh, most common term in them. So maybe these are closed cases. It's been a while since I worked with this, so I don't actually remember what that stuff out in the corner is. But what I did do is in the process of exploring this is I started tagging everything that I found. Um, as I was going through this, this classification system that the computer made based on, on this clustering. And so I can sort of walk through these branches one by one and say, what's this one talking about? Person releasing, releasing support. I guess that's, uh, you know, they're letting something, someone out of detention or something. And I end up with all these tags, ambulances, IEDs, stuff on Afghanistan, which wasn't even supposed to be in there, fired on friendly, whenever I found them shooting at each other, uh, TCP, which means traffic control point, uh, many shots, which is where I found an incident where they had more than one shot. So I, I sort of went 
through this material that the computer had organized for me. And what I ended up with was uh, a story. Oh yeah, so there you go. That's what it looks like when it's all working. The documents appear in there. This story. I wrote a story not about an individual incident, but about three years of history and 600 incidents. And there were a few really tragic incidents where they killed a number of people. But mostly what they did is they fired into the engine block of an oncoming car. So that's kind of interesting. And I also found uh, policy documents that explain how, you know, what rules they were operating under. And I found several different versions of it from several years that the computer had grouped together. And so I was able to trace the evolution of the policies guiding them. And then, of course, the, you know, this isn't the only way that you can cover this type of story. I also had phone interviews with uh, an official from the Department of State. And so the combination of the documents and the interviews and uh, a lot of background material from Associated, Repress, Associated Press, wow, that's an interesting one, uh, reporters who were in Iraq at the time and put together this broader story, which may not have been possible without computer-assisted techniques because I can't read that much. Certainly not on a deadline. So this is another definition from that paper, and this is talking about the idea that there's all of this information out there, and in fact, more all the time. We're hearing a lot about open data and open government and transparency. Well, all of these are wonderful things, but, but here's a thought. Transparency doesn't mean anything if nobody's looking. So we are starting, in many places in the world and in many situations, we still have problems getting access to the information. As that problem is starting to be solved, and actually the outlook is bright, the, the, uh, there is becoming a, a global norm, even in China, that government records and government operations should be publicly available. And many journalists are fighting for this and fighting for this successfully. But we now have another problem, which is going through all of this material and going through all of it systematically. There are, for example, uh, in the Securities and Exchange Commission requires in the US public companies to file certain types of reports. There are 10,000 such reports filed every day. It's one thing to chase a particular story, you know, you get a tip or you have an idea and you do a search. It's another thing to try to say, we're gonna cover every public company. We're going to try to look at all of it. And to do that, you have to have computers. So this is the first place where computer science is relevant to journalism. And this, I think, is, of all of these areas that I'm going to talk about, probably the best understood. This idea that you can take a whole bunch of data, and I'm using data very broadly here, so all of those documents which I showed you, some of which were handwritten documents, I'm calling that data as well. I'm just saying data is a volume of source information and you use computer science techniques in the reporting. And there's different branches of computer science that are relevant to this. So visualization, which I showed you today, uh, statistical techniques, which I know um, some folks at the JMSC have been working on, language processing, uh, and even graph theory, because you want to do network analyses of various types. But there are other things that you can use computers for in the journalism process. So this is, I think, what most people would think of as data. This is a chart of numbers. These are, in fact, uh, unemployment status of the civilian population by race, sex, and age. So this is a detailed demographic breakdown of unemployment, uh, again, in the US. Now, we can take that and turn it into this, this was one of my, I think still my all-time favorite piece of uh, interactive visualization. The jobless rate for people like you, uh, New York Times, uh, uh, end of 2009. So it's a bit old, but it's still a great example. So that highlighted line there, that's the unemployment rate. So if you read stories about unemployment rose to 7.5%, they're talking about this line. It's for the entire population. But when you start asking, well, what about different demographics? So white men, 15 to 24 with a high school degree. 
well, that's suddenly a lot higher. Or white men and women age 45 and older. Or you can break it down this way. Let's say Hispanic women, 25 to 44, not a high school graduate. 14% unemployment. That's a lot higher than that 7% number. Or let's say black men, young, no high school graduate, 48%. So that tells you that that top line number, you know, 8% or whatever the national average is, hides a huge amount of variation. And there are communities where 50% of the people are unemployed, not 7%. This is a way of, I think this shows a bunch of different things. One is exploring a much larger volume of information than, uh, never mind a single chart, uh, a, a single headline couldn't tell you this, certainly. And, and also allows you to personalize it in a way. This is. Um, this is a powerful idea to take uh, a volume of data for which there may be not one stories but thousands of stories. Another really good example of this is a, a project called Dollars for Docs from ProPublica. And um, what they did is they tracked payments from pharmaceutical companies uh, for speaking engagements. Uh, very hard to get the information. And in fact, as a result of this series, there are now proposed laws to require the information to, I find this very interesting, not just be available, but be available in machine-readable form. Because this started with PDFs that were in really bad shape. And the interesting thing here is, you know, they've got sort of totals and visualizations, and, you know, there's, there's various ways of aggregating this. But you can also ask about an individual doctor, right? So, you know, if your doctor is called Jones, Here you go, let's say, uh, I don't know, oh, they're in Jonesboro. Anyway, here, here's a particular doctor, right? And uh, here's all the money that they received and from who. So it allows the, the personalization of stories as well. Uh, it's a way that journalists don't normally think. They think about producing a piece of journalism, uh, producing a story, and that's the final product. But the, th this is what's starting to be called a news application. It is a piece of software connected to data of public concern, and that, and that is the story. I mean, we don't even really know what to call this yet, but it, is a, it, it fulfills the, the purpose and the, the role of journalism, certainly, which it makes that information visible, makes it accessible, brings it to public information, or to public attention, and also personalizes it. Journalists have always asked the question, okay, but you know, why should I care? Or how does this relate to, to me, right? That's the answer you're trying to ask as a journalist. So I'm writing this story, and it leads to stupid things, right? You see, you know, I'm, the, the American wire services are always writing about how many Americans died in the plane crash in Algeria, right? Well, is that really interesting? I'm sure, you know, uh, Xinhua is writing about how many Chinese are dying in plane crashes in the U.S., it's kind of silly, but you can see what they're getting at. They're trying, to they're, they're trying to make it relevant to an individual person. I'll just close this. So yeah, there was that example that we looked at. Um, this is a, was another nice one. This was a, an interactive visualization of who owes who what in the European debt crisis. Again, it starts as a bunch of numbers uh, visualization is a powerful technique for illuminating that sort of, that sort of data. Um, this is work that's done at the JMSC. This is uh, called uh, the uh, Open Land Data Map, which uh, Cedric Sam was here worked on. And I don't think I have this here to, to show you, but this is work uh, scraping public records on land use. So buildings planned, buildings completed, uh, Again, this information is nominally available. In principle, you can get this information, but if it's all in a bunch of text records, PDF records, to, to have that is not the same as having an application where you can scroll around on a map and see who's building what and click on things and, and understand what's going on in your neighborhood, perhaps. Uh, this is we just looked at. This was uh, dollars for docs. Um, this one's kind of fun. This is the Los Angeles Times crime map. 
Uh, this is becoming, you know, crime is a staple of, of uh, journalism in general. And uh, so this shows for each area, uh, plots all of the crimes over some time period and seems to be not quite working. Yeah, some, some issue with Google Maps here. Uh, anyway, when it works, it looks like that. And so you can see it plots both violent crimes and nonviolent crimes. And there's many things I like about this. One of them is that uh, crime coverage in journalism is actually very skewed. There's a lot of research showing that, for example, and fortunately it's exactly what you would think, right? Not all murders get covered in the press, and the factors that make a murder most, more, more likely to be covered are, I mean, you can just guess them, right? Victim is uh, young, female, white, affluent, famous, lives in a good neighborhood, right? All of those things mean the crime is more likely to be covered. And the, in some cities, depending on the crime rate, uh, more than half of crimes don't go covered. And the, of course, only the most sensational ones do. So that gives you a skewed picture. Um, this plots everything, and one of the things that comes out of it is you can see that actually uh, property crime or nonviolent crimes are much more common, the, the, the orange markers as opposed to the red markers. The other thing it does, which is very interesting, is it actually generates automated stories. It knows the baseline rate of crime for any particular neighborhood, and if, the, if there's a week which it jumps way above baseline, it actually generates an automated alert and puts it on the site. It, produces, it essentially writes a story and will also email you if you want to subscribe to that. So we're also seeing, uh, beginning to see computers producing stories by watching data in automated fashion. They're not very exciting stories, but on the other hand, you know, many crime stories are reiterations of a police blotter, so they're not very exciting either. So this is the second place where computer science is useful in journalism, the idea of presentation or communication. And this includes visualization and news applications, uh, searchable databases, uh, all of these places where it's not finding the story that's really the problem, it's presenting it to the users in a way that they can understand that's the problem. So areas of computer science, of course, visualization, again, uh, interactive design, there's, you know, entire developing field, uh, mostly from other areas, like, you know, video games are the ultimate example. Uh, uh, you know, interactive storytelling, there, there's a whole field which is asking the question, what is narrative structure when the user has choices? How do you do that? Um, of course, web application programming and design is a huge industry by itself. Lots of that is valuable to journalism. Uh, and, and user interface principles, um, or user interface design in the broadest sense. This is a very challenging design problem to take this and turn it into that. Like all good pieces of design, it seems sort of obvious once the solution is known. But of course, they don't start with this, right? It starts with reporters and designers and programmers sitting around looking at that going, what matters and how do we communicate it? That's an entire uh, specialty. But then there's another area, and now we're starting to get into the, the regions where journalists don't really talk about. Uh, there's no tradition in journalism of talking about how do you build a good news aggregator? What even is a good news aggregator? This is Google News, of course. Google News reads every news site in the world in 30 or 40 languages. This is, of course, the English edition, but there's a Chinese edition. There's several Chinese editions. You can get it in simplified and traditional. There's a Taiwan version. Uh, and it scrapes every article in the world, and it does two things that are very interesting. One is it says uh, these 500 stories are about the same event. So it figures out how many stories are talking about the same thing and collapses them into one item. And then it orders them. And it orders them based on a lot of things. It orders them based on um, ultimately human judgment, but aggregate human judgment as expressed by how high on the page editors have put a story. Are people talking about it? Are people using Google News clicking on it? Are they sharing it on social media? All of these signals, they're called, which indicate collectively maybe this is an important story. Now, this is an algorithmic filter for the information we receive. 
Uh, the Associated Press alone runs about 10,000 stories a day. When you start to ask what's the global output of the journalism industry, it starts to run into the millions. When you then add, okay, what about all of the bloggers and, well, you know what, let's just say everything on the web, everything with a URL. We're talking hundreds of millions of items a day, perhaps. I don't even know, very hard to estimate. But the point is, you're not reading 1% of this. You're not even reading one-tenth of your percent. You're not off by a factor of 100. You're off by a factor of millions or tens of millions. So only a tiny slice of the world is going to make it to your attention each day. And the question is, what slice? How do we decide? And I would argue that algorithms are a necessary part of this process because we simply can't deal with the volume of information. Not only can we not deal, but the information that you need may be different than the information that than you need. So we want this to be personalized as well. So they're here to stay, and filtering algorithms exist in, of course, aggregators like Google News, but also the Facebook news feed, Twitter's trending topics. Um, if you go to a news site and it says stories recommended for you, that's an algorithmic filter. They're really, uh, to, to sort of go off into the, the media theory jargon, algorithms are very important in mediating the public sphere at this point. Now, how many of you have heard of this idea of the filter bubble? Anyone? Eli Pariser? It's the idea that, um, well, there's this effect, right? If you can select what you want to read out of all of these options, and then the computer is watching what you pick and giving you more of that, because that's the most straightforward way to detect what it is that you want your filter to do, then you might end up in this narrower and narrower world. One of the, the virtues of an editor is they can make choices. There's this old idea in, in journalism, you know, the stories that the audience wants versus the stories that they need. And it's always a balance. To some degree, one of the roles of the editor is to say, you know what, maybe nobody wants to know about, uh, you know, uh, a violent attack in the northern Mali desert, but maybe they should know. There's a lot of things we don't want to talk about, and of course one of the jobs of journalism is to talk about those things, to say the things that people don't want to hear. So if you build an algorithmic system that only gives you what you want to hear, arguably that's not news, that's entertainment. And I have nothing against entertainment, but it's a different goal. And this effect of people sorting their information consumption when they have the choice is very real. This is a map of uh, book sales during the 2008 presidential election. So if you go to Amazon uh, and you look at an item, anyone seen the, you know, people who bought this also bought that? Right, so that's, that's an algorithm watching what people buy together and it's using it to make recommendations. And you can trace those just very manually, just click on one book, see what else people bought. And you, at this point in 2008, you ended up with this graph. And what you see is that people generally buy the red books or the blue books, but not both. So people sort themselves in terms of their information consumption. Uh, and this is true in many, many different spheres. This is uh, retweets of political information on Twitter. And what you have here is the color indicates uh, it's a computer analysis of whether you're saying predominantly more uh, conservative or liberal things. And the edge is when one person retweets another one. And you find these two very clear clusters. There's some overlap in the middle, but by and large, people are talking about one or not the other. So this raises questions about uh, algorithmic filter design. Is this good? Do we want to try to bridge these worlds? Here's another example of um, what uh, what the space of discourse looks like. This is every, um, as of 2009, pretty much every Persian language website. And they're color coded by humans who are rating them by topics. So we have uh, conservative politics, reformist politics, uh, the expats in yellow there, uh, and then you know, poetry and some other things. So sort of the topics of the Persian language web. And uh, there, the computers put the dots closer together if there's lots of links between them. And what you see is pretty much what you would expect. The, the expats and the reformers are kind of all intermingled. That's on the left there. And then the conservative politics and the religious use are kind of all intermingled. But there's not much between them. So you can, you can start to see the structure of these networks. 
And what I would like to do is ask questions about how do we build information filters, algorithmic information filters, that expose us to a broader world, maybe to things that we're not looking about. Try to replicate this, this journalistic idea of the news you need, not necessarily the news you want. That is, a, that is a question squarely at the intersection of computer science and journalism. It's not a question that a computer scientist can answer because it rests in a long journalistic tradition and a long editorial tradition and ideas about what it is that it's important to talk about. It's not a question that a journalist alone can answer because the techniques available to do it are the computer science techniques of natural language processing and visualization and recommendation engines. It is only a thing that can be done in the intersection. And one of the things that I would like to see done is, you know, plot my, all of the news that's been available to me for the last month in a chart like this, and then color the things that I've actually read in one color. I'm looking for a UR here marker on a map, right? So we have, we have a search engine, uh, and we can search the whole web. We don't have a map of the whole web. It's the, it's the difference between looking up cities in an index at the back of an atlas and going to the middle of the atlas and looking at the world map and saying, oh, I see that I live here, but there's also the rest of the world. That's an experience that's very hard to have with the information available to us. So this is another place where computer science intersects journalism, one that generally, it, there is no tradition within journalism of talking about this yet, but I'm, I'm hoping to establish one. It's this question of filtering. Now we have many, many stories. I've drawn three there. Of course, the actual number is more like millions. Uh, and of course, not just things produced by professional journalists, but everything else. Journalism can no longer ignore the rest of the, of the internet, uh, which is a whole other topic. But we can apply computer science techniques. So natural language processing for understanding the content of articles, machine learning for trying to, under, to generate recommendations and uh, predict what people are going to need or want to know about, uh, and social software, this idea of software that allows humans to work together. Consider the Facebook like button. That like button does a lot of different things. It's, it's a very simple social act. It's, uh, what anthropologists sometimes call phatic communication, P-H-A-T-I-C. Has anyone heard of that before? Okay, when I walk into a room and I greet my friend and I say, how are you? Do I actually want to know how they are? Usually not. I mean, I can ask that question sincerely, you know, like, oh, how are you? But normally, what, what, all that how are you does is it's a signal, it's a greeting. It's, it's, it's a social interaction where there, there isn't really rational or literal content to it. It's, you know, it's, it's a, a glance in someone's direction or a hug or, you know, this originally came from, uh, this idea originally came from, from studying primates, right? It's, you know, it's the, the grooming, right? It's, it's this type of communication that keeps social networks together and keeps these relationships. And that's what the like button is. It's, this, it's the sort of smallest possible unit of like, ping, you know, I'm communicating to you and maintaining this connection between us. But it also generates information. If I look at the pattern of what people like, or who looks at whose profile, or who comments on what, or who clicks on what, I now have information that I can use to design filtering systems. I can start to understand the relationships between people. And maybe if something happens to someone that I'm close to, I care about it more than something happens to someone that I'm far away from. And of course, this is the principle that the Facebook news feed operates on. So this isn't just a computer science and a journalism problem. This is also a sociology problem. And it has both descriptive aspects, you know, how are people using the like button? What do people click on? And normative aspects. What should I show in terms of news stories? What is healthy? What is good for people? All open questions at this time. There's one more area, major area, where computer science applies to journalism, and that is tracking the distribution of information or the effects of information. Also something not really in journalism yet. Uh, this is a thing called Meme Tracker. What Meme Tracker did is it read the whole web. This was, again, work during the 2008 uh, US presidential election read the entire web and looked for quotes. 
and it watched, so you can put lipstick on a pig. You know, it peaked uh, around September 7th and went for a few days and fell off. Our entire economy is in danger. So lipstick on a pig with Sarah Palin, um, this just tracked uh, all political figures essentially. And it actually watched this information transmit and mutate. People would requote it or misquote it. it. It saw which sources got it first and then where it transmitted to. Uh, it looked at, um, you know, they were able to do analyses like, do, does the mainstream media get it before or after blogs? What is the fall off in attention? How long do people talk about something? What is, what is this characteristic shape? Uh, amazing work, uh, actually uh, developed out of research into bioinformatics. Uh, algorithms that were originally designed to track the mutations of DNA sequences through species are now being applied to watch information flow. And we can do this. We can do this on the entire web now. But again, so many open questions. Um, for example, we could apply machine translation, which is coming along, and watch ideas spread between different languages. We could start to answer in a systematic way questions like, what type of news makes it from the Chinese to English border? What, what crosses that language barrier? Not just at the case study level, but at the level of the entire web. Nobody's done this yet. We can also do things by watching the spread of information on social media. Coney 2012, uh, ring a bell for anyone? This, this video that had a uh, hundred million hits in two days. It was this uh, documentary, advocacy piece, uh, arguing for the uh, prosecution of uh, Joseph Coney, who is, um, runs us, how to describe it, uh, uh, I guess a, a minor but very dangerous warlord in northern Uganda. Um, now, this, this is a whole topic on its own, and there's been a lot of written about you know, did they really represent the problem accurately? Is this sort of advocacy ethical, uh, the way they pressured celebrities to retweet it? It's a fascinating case study. But what I want to draw your attention to is this work by Social Flow, uh, which is a, a New York uh, social media agency, where they took the whole data set of who retweeted what, and they were able to track how it got this amplification. How did it get 100 million views in, uh, I think it was three or four days? Uh, and so they looked at the early network. So Invisible there, that's Invisible Children. That's the uh, producers of that film. Uh, you can see that they're at this cluster, and they, you know, a lot of people retweeted them very early. But then there's these, these other clusters. And it looks like what happened is actually Invisible Children is not just an online operation. They had been touring around the US uh, doing this presentation in schools. And so these are networks of students, uh, many of them uh, sort of uh, Christian youth groups who amplified this message and, and spread it out into the broader world. Um, and we can do this for any story that we produce. If people are talking about it in a public medium like, like Twitter or Weibo, we can watch it spread now. This has incredible implications for questions of, uh, first of all, obvious implications for the business of journalism. You know, how do we increase our audience reach? So people are mostly looking into it from that angle. A lot of overlap there with marketing and PR, but also implications for what is the impact of our journalism? What is the effectiveness? Does reach metrics of this sort correlate with reform? If I'm doing a piece and I'm saying, you know, there, uh, there are substandard construction going on all over this province and the buildings are collapsing in earthquakes and killing people, ultimately, the reason I'm doing that journalism is I want that to stop. So it stops or it doesn't. There's change or there isn't. How does the ultimate effect of our journalism, how does that depend on who reads it and when and how many people? We don't know. And we can also turn this around. We can say, let's look at propaganda, right? Because there's this whole, uh, you might call it persuasive technology, um, micro-targeting of voters, uh, marketing, PR, uh, of censorship, of course, uh, understanding what various actors are doing in the online public sphere is, I argue, part of journalism. We need to keep tabs on this stuff because th this is very sophisticated technology and if everyone else is using it and journalism doesn't understand it, we're not even going to be playing in the same game. So it's necessary to bring this into journalism now.
if for no other reason than we have to know what other people are doing. So we can use computer science to track effects or the flow or spread of information. And so some buzzwords that are associated with this, this idea of big data, right? So I'm talking about tracking the whole web, tracking large sets of social media <coughs> posts, visualization, of course, more natural language processing. Language processing comes up a lot. Uh, bioinformatics, uh, te applying techniques from bioinformatics to watch information spread and change. So that's sort of my argument. Um, I think there's basically four places that uh, journalism and computer science intersect in an important way. So the reporting, finding stories from large amounts of information, tracking things down, uh, presentation, so communicating that information because it's, uh, journalism isn't just about having the knowledge, it's about drawing attention to it, making it understandable, making it personally relevant, making somebody care. Filtering, this question of who sees what. To a huge extent, the information that we see on a daily basis is mediated by algorithms. If journalists wish to play in the public sphere, they have to have a hand in developing those algorithms. And then the spread or the tracking or the flow of information um, obvious applications for journalism, but also journalists just need to understand it because other people are doing it. This is, um, in the center there are, are, uh, there are lectures from the computational journalism class that I'm teaching here and at Columbia. And I've uh, sort of tried to, to show all of the different fields that that work draws on. So there's a lot of uh, different subfields of computer science, language processing, AI, we, we haven't talked at all about um, trying to do um, sort of qu open question answering. So, you know, you want to type into your computer, um, you know, or, or here, here's, the, here's the one that, you know, it's the, it's the, the ultimate goal, right? You, you, we're so far from doing this, but we're getting closer. Uh, you know, what is uh, Wang Jiabao's net worth, right? Search, you, know, you can imagine answering this. Search all of the databases and all of the references and all of the news stories and sum it all up. We're very far away from doing that. But we can already do things like, show me all of the people this person went to school with. That we can do now. Uh, and we're getting better at it. We have to do a lot of inference. We have to, to try to pick apart. We're often very interested in analyzing. You know, in the US, of course, right now, there's a big gun violence and gun control debate. So, you know, do more guns cause more crime? Well, that's a very complicated statistical inference problem. And if journalists want to have something to say about that, they have to at least understand the statistics involved. Um, also, I've put cognitive science because to try to understand how people process information and come to conclusions and what are the standard cognitive biases. Um, sociology, if you, I mean, I, I talked about the social aspect of, of online computation and, um, we need to understand that too. So there's all of these different areas that uh, journalism can draw on. It's broader than computer science. It's the intersection of computer science with a lot of these other things that are very interesting. Uh, I would argue that journalism has suddenly become massively interdisciplinary and has to be. I want to show you um, the, the not quite uh, conclusion here. This is a, a prototype uh, recently funded by the Knight Foundation, uh, which is the same organization that funds my work. Um, what they're trying to do here, the ultimate goal is to take live broadcasts of political speech and have the computer automatically fact check it. So it's a combination of several technologies. It's uh, machine transcription, which is not great, but it's coming along, and the accuracy is good enough that you can do something like this. And it's uh, a reporter's previous work fact-checking. So things like factcheck.org and PolitiFact. What you have is a database of statements that have been extensively vetted. And if you can match what someone just said with something in this database, you can then rate it true or false. So I'm going to show you this. So this is not live. Uh, this is um, pre-recorded, because this is a prototype. It actually doesn't work that well yet, but they, it works well enough that they just got a grant to try to make it work. And the, one of the things I want you to understand is that you can look at this and say, oh, well, it doesn't really work. Or you can look at this and say, oh, it's coming. And uh, 
you know, I think the history of technology su suggests the wiser course there. So let's, um, uh oh, we we've got, might have internet issues again. Let's see if this will, this will go for us. Uh, yeah, I should have. Uh, it's actually extraordinarily quiet even here. All right, so we'll just we'll just have to pretend that you can hear what you're saying. So what you're, you're seeing it do here is it's tracking the uh, statement that they're saying to the transcript. So in a moment you'll see that that highlight move. And it's real time. Uh, this is done with pre-recorded video. The ultimate goal is to do it real time. So I'm fast forwarding it, and then when he says this line, there you go, the computer goes, oh, he just said something that's false. <laughs> and then gives you a link to the, uh, the reference to it. So we're just about there. We're just about at the place where we can have a computer watch a live news feed and pop up an alert saying, that person just, no. just lied, just said a, a falsehood. We're nearly there. I, I would say, you know, I would be surprised if this isn't um, common five years from now, or at least possible. Now, whether, whether or not catches on is another question. You know, do we want this? You have to get into the nuances of what's true and, and false, and, you know, can, you, know can, you do, can you establish enough authority that this is useful to people? Um, but certainly from a technical point of view, this is going to be possible very soon. For the database, is it manual or automatic? How automatic can that be? It's, right now it's very manual. So this is, you know, they, they have a column called the fact checker and there's organizations called pol like PolitiFact and factcheck.org. All they do is check contentious statements. But what seems to happen is that uh, a false idea gets repeated continuously you know, very, very common, right? So there's some leverage you can get there by, um, you know, once you've checked something to just, the, the, the goal is to detect references, not to adjudicate on the tru truth or falseness. Although, that's coming along too. How many of you have seen um, Watson, the IBM computer that won at Jeopardy? So the state of the art now is that a computer can beat a, the best human players at Jeopardy by a, by a small margin. Still, it's pretty amazing, and, and so the, that, that technology is generally referred to as open domain question answering. So open domain meaning you can ask about anything. And so we, I think that's farther out, but we're going to get to a point where the computers could automate this entire process by checking against other references. That's a ways away. But it raises so many questions that are so central to journalism, and my, what I'm trying to say is, this is a question that, this, this line of research is not something that can be answered by computer scientists alone or journalists without computer science. The last thing I want to show you is um, uh, more work that's done at the JMSC. Um, so this is labeled sneak preview, but it is on the web, so I'm assuming it's okay to, to show this. Uh, so many of you know that uh, the JMSC has been recording uh, Weibo. Sino uh, Webo since uh, January 2011, if I'm calling correctly. Yeah. So there's over 300 million of these recorded. Not it's not everybody, but it's a few hundred thousand of the most uh, popular users. Uh, and it's been doing this for a lot of reasons. Uh, one is a historical record, also for various types of analysis. How does information spread? And also, there's a lot of interest in how does censorship work online. So what this is is it's visualization of each uh, row is a particular Weibo, a particular message. So I can click on one and there you go, it's a particular post. It should load up the uh, text, no? Oh, a black dot, okay. There you go, so there's the, the actual text. And then the, the gray dots are uh, reposts. So when someone reposts that. So you can see the, the trajectory of each of these things. And then um, 
these are, these are the ones that have been deleted. So this is an archive of which posts were deleted and you can see sort of how that breaks down over time and also how popular. So this was a really popular one because it had lots of reposts, whereas this one didn't. Or, or it shows that it, it deleted, was deleted before people could repost it. Oh, I see. So if it, if it, if it wasn't, right, OK. It's an indication of like how long does it take to, to, uh, to censor it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we can start to say, uh, as, you know, we can start to get a real description of the dy dynamics of uh, social media censorship in China from this type of analysis, which is only possible with, uh, you know, in this case, large scale data sets and visualization. I mean, let, let's, you know, let's break down all of the areas of computer science that are involved to do this. Um, you know, most of which is the work of Cedric Sam sitting right there. So uh, the data capture, um, you know, there's some work in databases and storage and, you know, dealing with relatively large data, although not huge, actually quite manageable. Um, there's visualization, so making this understandable and accessible. Uh, and then there's some interaction design and web programming that went into this. So a lot of different things. And then we can start to get into um, work that's also being done here on, on statistical analyses of uh, you know, what words make a post more likely to be deleted. Anyway, that's, that's my talk. Um, I uh, will leave you with a, a couple things. Um, that's actually a real data journalism team. I haven't really used the, the term data journalism. Um, it, I, I differentiate a little bit of that from computational journalism. Um, most data journalism doesn't require advanced techniques. Most data journalism you can do with a spreadsheet, a technology which is now 40 years old. Uh, but the, the, to start to do some of the more sophisticated stuff, you do need to bring these areas of computer science in. And generally, the teams that are doing this well, like ProPublica and The Guardian, uh, they're very interdisciplinary. Um, I'm not going to bore you with everybody's name and biography, but we have there, we have some people with a programming background. We have some people with a, a journalism background who are originally reporters. Uh, we have uh, some, some design people who were originally graphic designers. So it's, it's bringing these types of teams together um, and of course, this is an industry setting, but uh, here at the, at the JMSC, we're doing it in an academic setting, uh, which is really where the, where the action is. And the last thing is, the question I always get is, how do I get started? So um, I would point you to two sources. One is the Data Journalism Handbook, which uh, especially if you're a journalist and wondering, how do you get into this? And there's a, m a massive amount I haven't talked about. I haven't talked about where you get the information. What the availability, what types of laws there are in different jurisdictions uh, to, to obtain this information. I haven't talked about um, the whole area of data provenance in general, which is a big deal. What types of stories are common? So a lot of that's in there. Or even, I haven't said anything about common tools. I've been talking about research. I've been talking about the state of the art. Um, to get started, what you want is to uh, get comfortable with Microsoft Excel and CSV files, and that, that goes into it. And then for the, the, uh, a lot of the, the fancier stuff I've talked about, um, as you know, I've, I've done a course here or a lecture series, and all of those are videoed, and there's a syllabus and lots of links, and um, any particular thing that you're interested in, you can find me talking for several hours about it. Uh, so if you can stand that, uh, that's your source. And of course, I'm always happy to talk to you. And uh, yeah, with that, questions. Questions, thoughts? Well, it depends. I mean, it, so it varies from country to country. Um, th that goes by a number of, of names. One of them is open government. Uh, but it's become an international concern. Um, I mean, you can even see references to this here. Uh, there, you know, there's, there's, there's talk about <coughs> open government things in Hong Kong. And I know that, that the JMSC has been active in, in, in pushing for some of that, uh, the LegCo records and that sort of thing. And the, the key is, uh, there's sort of two phases. One is 
is there the legal right to access the information? But in many cases there is, but the legal right to access the information could mean that you have to you know, show up on a Thursday between 1 and 3.30 and go down into the basement with a flashlight and find the files you need and take handwritten notes. That's not really access. So making them online and then online in a convenient form is the next step. Um, but there are campaigns all over the world. The, the uh, organizations like the World Bank are now starting to take this seriously. They have an open government arm and it's starting to be accepted as uh, a norm of good governance internationally at this point, even in China. Long way to go though. When, when you do something like the blood water the data analysis, mm -hmm. and say the engine blocks, right? You yeah. Right, so uh, the two answers. One is that the computer has grouped them. So, you know, you, you can see, oh, there's, you know, 400 of the documents, say, engine block. Um, the other is sampling. So, you, you know, it's, it's, it's essentially polling, right? So, you take a random sample and then you get error bounds. And, and you know, if you're doing a, a, you know, so I'll get some number like, you know, 70% of them plus or minus 5%. And if I'm a journalist, and you know, so I can report 70% plus or minus 5%, but really all I'm looking for is, is, that, is that story lead, right? So to me, I'm comfortable with saying most yeah. if I have 70% plus or minus 5. Yeah. Or, you know, maybe we can debate what that number needs really to be, need but. To you would actually, uh, yeah, later. Lower in the story, I have the exact figures, but it's. Um, you know, then you start to get into, well, you know, is it 70 or 80 that's important? And then, well, if you care, you can read the rest of the story. Yeah. Hi, Jonathan. Thanks for your talk. Um, my question is, in your opinion, what are the most pressing research areas in this field that you think will uh, fill the gap between journalism in practice mm -hmm. and Right, so research areas. Um, well, I would like to see that, that truth teller thing that, that, uh, that we've done, I would like to see that work extended because I think it's a very interesting application. So that would be uh, taking, the, the fundamental challenge there is parsing text and determining when a claim is made that matches against the database. So it, it's like That's sentence comparison. But in broader terms, um, I'm fascinated by problems of algorithmic filter design. I think I've, I've put forward a framework for a sort of a normative framework, so who, who should see a story? And I'm saying you should see a story if you've previously expressed an interest in it. So you've said, okay, I, I'm interested in Lindsay Lohan. Or the story affects you in some way. You know, my God, my house might be built with bad material. Or there's something you can do about it, which is the opposite side, which is, my house is fine, but I'm a legislator and I could pass a law to fix these houses. So there's three criteria, interest, effects, and agency. Now there, from a, a social science point of view, that's relatively straightforward, but from turning that into an algorithm, nobody knows how to do yet. So that's, that's to me a big research area. Another one is uh, cross-language and cross-cultural information flow. I think there's broad scope for using these types of computational techniques, especially machine translation, which is adv advancing very rapidly, to start to ask questions about when do ideas cross over from one language to another, what types of ideas, how fast, and how do they change? But it, they're complicated questions. I, I would argue that um, these questions, I mean, this is one of the reasons I like working in this intersection. These, these questions are harder than computer science questions uh, because you start to get into all of the ambiguity of the real world in a way that classic algorithm design doesn't really engage with. So I think this is actually a more difficult field. <laughs> it's, it's certainly one of the attractions for me. Yeah. When you work for the past two years, where's the hub of such research and development? You know, universities, industry, 
Right, so who's doing it? Um, a lot of it's academic. Um, there's um, some really good work. Um, so the meme tracker was out of Stanford. Um, there are other universities doing very interesting projects. Uh, industry is doing a lot of stuff. So a lot of the underlying technology is in, at places like Google. You know, Google built Google News. The news industry didn't build Google News. And uh, I think it's interesting to ask why that was. Uh, it has a lot to do with industry structure and business models. Uh, but I'm not really concerned about, you know, is it journalism? Is it being done by journalists? I don't think that's the interesting question. I think the interesting question is, you know, is the public being served in this important way? So um, industry, academia, and, and then uh, the media industry, um, really most of the sort of high-end data journalism work is happening in a small number of organizations, mostly in New York. Uh, but of course, we're trying to trying to, to get collaboration between these these areas and open lines of communication, and especially moving moving the research into practice is the hard part. You know, so all of the work that I've done with um, Overview, which is the document mining system, I didn't invent the algorithms. I just went through the work of figuring out which ones would apply to journalism, and that's the that's the part that's missing, and that's that's a a specialized type of work because you, it requires both a journalistic sense and a, and, a, and a working with journalists who are working on the problems. Uh, because I've seen so many tools that were designed by computer scientists that are useless for reporters. Uh, and it's, that's quite rare so far, is to have high-end computer scientists working at the same desk as uh, an experienced investigative reporter. Very rare still. Yes? Right, Jonathan, I'm, I'm just going to introduce myself. I'm Paul Evans, a visiting professor here. Mm -hmm. He's been my next door roommate for the last uh, three weeks. So I've yes. heard his sleeping habits and, uh, and I was even lecture. This is really fascinating. And it would be all right if I ask a question that goes a little bit beyond the yeah. journalism side some of the other social implications of what you're doing. Three small points, uh, maybe big points, but I'll raise them in brief form. Me meme tracker or meme tracker? Meme tracker. Does that go from one language to another? For example, we've been trying to trace how dominant ideas and international <coughs> relations mm -hmm. spread out, uh, a pivot, a rebalancing, as Mr. Obama has used it in that context. Right. And we watch the way these worlds float out in the universe. Can you do an English phrase and then see how it's being picked up in theory, um, I don't believe anybody's done it. So that would be the combination of the type of uh, bioinformatics technology that they apply to Meme Tracker with machine translation technology. What's interesting, even just from English to English, our publications in China pick up a phrase in English yeah. that was used elsewhere, but all in English. Um, second is on censorship. When you're doing this sign of label, Mm -hmm. um, in essence, what you're able to do is reverse engineer what a sensor does. <clears throat> if someone is going in, cutting off a phrase mm -hmm. uh, or a, 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 a site that is using particular kinds of words, what you can then do is backtrack and say what the logic is of the sensor by looking at patterns of words that are not being used at the moment. Everybody who uses uh, social media in China is aware of this, but we're doing it in a systematic way. Here at this school. Well, uh, so King Wall is doing it. You but. can then put out a guidebook uh, on essentially the patterns of Chinese censorship, looking at the, the, the way they, they hit the buttons at particular times. We've got something that's really interesting. And if I'm right, then I want to come back to the last question, which is on uh, last observation, which is on state control of these matters. Uh -huh. Some of these things are really sensitive issues uh, that you're looking at. And states are going to be, uh, are in the business mm -hmm. of uh, controlling some of these kinds of information flows. Uh, and you've got this, this whole world that emerges out there uh, of, of what, uh, what governments are doing to try to control cyberspace, including the flows of some of this kind of information. Is this picture all left or all right? Or no, I mean, I think you're right. I mean, one of the, one of the, the, the terms that, um, you know, I, I throw around with, with my friends, which I, you know, it's kind of a fun word, but doesn't, isn't really well defined, is we talk about computational propaganda. 
if you look at the way that the most recent U.S. election was won, part of what happened there is the Obama campaign targeted voters to the individual level. And it wasn't just sending emails and so forth, which they were very sophisticated about. They, based on your whole past history and demographics, and they actually sent uh, hundreds of different versions depending on who you were. And in fact, uh, at, there was a project at ProPublica to use text analysis techniques and machine learning techniques to, first of all, they had all of their users forward the emails, so there was a crowdsourcing technique to get the data, and then to reverse engineer how the Obama campaign was deciding which email to send. So that's an instance where a journalism organization was monitoring the use of computational techniques by a political organization in order to describe what they were doing. And uh, so that's going to become very, very interesting, I think. And you can use that on China, too. We just have to Absolutely. Get you there, right? Because yeah. the, the, again, the Chinese is extremely manipulative, the government, right? Control. And they're using Weibo, too. They set up zillions, zillions of their own accounts. Mm -hmm. So you can trace how they get the messages out and their method of control and censorship. Yeah, to, to some extent. To some extent, journalism has to get into this game um, purely because powerful actors are getting into it. So even if, even if journalists have no interest in using these techniques for their own work, uh, the fact that you know, marketers, governments are using these types of, of mass information, targeting, tracking, spread, censorship, means that journalists have to be there as well. Yeah. There, yeah, there's a, there's a whole book now. Um, there was a, a, a wonderful piece in the New York Times this summer called, um, I forget the exact title, but it was an argument by someone who wrote a book called Victory Lab, which was all about how campaigns are won now, arguing that political reporters are 10 years behind what campaigns are actually doing. And this is part of why. You know, the, the types of analyses that political reporters are doing, you know, looking at the poll numbers, right? That's a national poll. They're, they're, you know, the campaigns are now looking at individual people, not state polls. So they're, be, they're behind, for sure.